Have you ever been inspired to make an application after visiting a website? And then you go to find that website's API either is non-existent or is so bad that you can't actually do anything you wanted to do in the first place. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to take any website in the whole world and turn it into an API with Google Chrome, Puppeteer, and Google Cloud. We're gonna look for a content-rich but API-poor website in order for us to work with. Oh, hey, look, Craigslist. Craigslist is a good example because there might be a million things you would like to do with local listings, but a generic API would have a difficult time serving your needs. What should we do with Craigslist? What? You wanna look for bunnies? That's a great idea. You're, you know me. Now, because we're not gonna be driving all over the country, we need to localize our search. Now, what state do you think has the most cutest bunnies at any given point in time? New Hampshire? That's a good idea. Let's check it out. That's perfect. All right, this URL looks good. We're going to wanna to make sure that we have the has image option checked so that we can make sure that we're getting images back with our results because we're not gonna buy a bunny unless we can see it first. So we have the first step. We have the URL that we wanna grab data from. The next step is to actually start our project. You can start a project any way you want. We're just gonna create a directory. I'm gonna call it headless-chrome, call it whatever you want. In this tutorial, we're gonna be using Node and the Node Package Manager, NPM, in order to install and track our dependencies. NPM tracks its dependencies in a package.json file. You can create this file by hand if you wanted to, or you can use the npm init command to create a generic package.json file. Just accept the default options, let's get on. So next we're gonna to wanna to install our Puppeteer library. Puppeteer is a library and set of APIs that allow you to programmatically control a web browser like Chrome. To install any node packages, you just use the npm install command. So here we're just gonna use npm install puppeteer. npm will go out to its registry, download puppeteer, read its metadata stored in a package.json file, download all of its dependencies, and then store all of these in a node modules directory in your project. Puppeteer also downloads an instance of the Chromium browser, so you don't even have to have an instance of Chrome proper in order to use Puppeteer. This makes it great and a lot more portable because wherever you put your script, you can just install the dependencies and it'll have everything necessary to run right like that. Now our project's all set up, let's write some code. I use Visual Studio Code, which is turning out to be a fantastic IDE for any sort of development. I used to use WebStorm and a lot of JetBrains products, I used to use Sublime Text. Now Visual Studio Code is easily the go-to editor for virtually any text file. Now that our project is open, you'll notice that there are a couple files in a directory in there. NPM is managing all that. The package.json, package-lock.json, and the node modules directory. All those manage your dependencies and metadata for your project. Next, create a file. You can call this whatever you want as long as it ends in a .js extension. We're gonna call ours index.js, which is a pretty common practice for JavaScript-based projects, just like index.html would be your main file for web-based projects. So first up, we import the Puppeteer library and assign it to a variable like Puppeteer. Next, we create an asynchronous function called getBunnies in order to hold our logic. We're creating an async function because there is a lot of asynchronous operation between the browser and Puppeteer, and those are exposed via promises. So using the async await API available in latest versions of JavaScript makes it a lot easier to manage this. You're going to see await here a lot. The gist of it is, is that it's basically saying, hey, wait for the result of this expression before moving on. Let's quickly run our script just to make sure that everything is hooked up properly. Running any JavaScript file in Node is as simple as writing node space your script. So here's just node space index.js. But you'll notice here that if you do run your script, nothing seems to happen. This is okay, this is totally normal. Puppeteer by default is set up to run in headless mode, which means we're not gonna see a browser. This is okay. Conveniently though, Puppeteer gives you the option of going between headless and GUI mode pretty simply. When you use our script now, it'll open up the browser. Opening up a browser is actually kinda cool, but it's not gonna do anything unless we tell it to do something. In order to go to a URL, 
we need to get a page instance. A page in the Puppeteer API is analogous to a tab in the browser. We can get a new page by using the new page method, or we can query the list of open pages and get an existing page. We're gonna use the new page method because it's one line. We're going to take the URL that we got just a few minutes ago and pass it to our pages go to method. So if you run our script now, you'll see the browser pop open, you'll see a new tab open, and you'll see the browser navigate to the URL we specified. Awesome but you'll also notice that there's this weird visual glitch. I'm not sure why it happens, but I do know how to get around it. You can pass default viewport colon null to the launch options, which will allow the viewport to expand to the browser dimensions. Now, if you run our script, everything looks perfect. Now that we have the browser programmatically controlled to go to the URL that we wanna be working with, the next step is to analyze the page to find out where we can hook into in order to get the data that we're looking for. You can do this by using Chrome's DevTools the same way that you would if you were debugging any other web page. Press F12 to open up the DevTools. There's a button in the upper left-hand corner that if clicked will turn your cursor into an element selector so that when you click on any element in the page, you'll automatically jump to the point in the DOM tree where that element resides. The next step is to walk back up the DOM tree to find the parent element that contains all the results. Here you can find an unordered list that contains all the list items that make up all of our results. Each list item in that list has a class of result-row. So this ends up being the API in the page that we use to access these results. Now that we have found the element that contains each individual result, the next step is to poke inside that element to find the pieces of data in it that we want to expose in our API. So poking through, it looks like we have images stored in a div with a class of swipe. It looks like there are multiple images there. We'll just need to focus on one. Looking a little bit lower, you'll see a paragraph element that has a class result-info. Inside that, you'll see a span with a class of result-meta that contains a lot of the information that we're looking for. Price the neighborhood, any tags associated with the post. Above the span, you'll also see an anchor tag that has the URL to the post and the title of the post. When programmatically controlling browsers, especially when navigating to pages that have a lot of dynamic content on it, there will inevitably be a time where you need to wait for something to exist on the page before moving on. Puppeteer has a number of different wait for methods to make it convenient for your script to wait for something to exist on the page or for something to happen on the page so that you can make sure that you have access to the things that you wanna have access to when you need to access them. Here, we're going to just use the simple wait for method and we're gonna pass it a CSS selector. This tells Puppeteer to wait until something with this CSS selector appears on the page. The selector we're going to use is the class name for the list items in the result list. So we can make sure that our results are populated before the script continues. When interacting with a browser, you have the option to inject JavaScript into the page or try to do as much as possible in Puppeteer. I have found that it is easier to do as much as possible inside the page context and leave Puppeteer to do things like control the browser, open up new tabs, simulate events, or do things when I need to look especially human. This allows me to reduce the complexity of Puppeteer scripts uh, while also kind of sandboxing page interaction within the page context itself. Puppeteer makes injecting JavaScript into the page especially easy with a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. Here we're going to be using the $eval method or bling bling eval if you prefer which allows us to pass a CSS selector and a function to the method. And Puppeteer will query for that CSS selector and then pass the results to that function. This is perfect because what we're trying to do is translate a bunch of list items to other data. We're just gonna quickly wire this up and then basically print the contents back out to the console so that we can make sure that everything is actually working properly. Script runs, browser opens, we pop back over to the terminal, and we see a whole bunch of stuff logged. Now, I'm not really sure what this stuff is. I'm just happy that something's logged. As far as I'm concerned, we're good to go. Because we're creating an API, I wanna translate this whole list of list items into a whole list of JavaScript objects 
with metadata for those list items so that they can be consumed by other programs more easily. Whenever you hear translate one list to another list, you should think of the map method in JavaScript. This allows you to supply a function that translate every individual element to something else. And that's perfect for what we're looking to do. In order to get the data out of the elements that we've already isolated, we just need to use standard browser APIs like query selector, get attribute, whatever else in order to get that data and populate our properties object. Here, we're just using the query selector method scoped to the row with the CSS selector dot result dash title in order to get the anchor tag that hides the title and the URL to the post. We grab the title via the title elements inner text property. And in order to get the URL, we grab the href attribute of the title element. Running our script again, browser opens, go to the page, head back to the terminal. Instead of seeing a bunch of just random objects, we now see our data structures in a very consumable format. Now that we're comfortable programmatically controlling a browser, we don't really need it open anymore. Now we could make it fully headless, but for the sake of demonstration, it's helpful to see it pop open. We just don't need it to stay open. So at the end of our script, we're just gonna make sure that we close the browser. Can you guess what method you use to close the browser? Browser.close. Hopefully you're seeing at this point that the API for Puppeteer is actually really nice to use. To flesh out our API, we're just gonna poke through another few elements in order to grab the metadata we're looking for in order to make our API better. Because we're looking at things for sale, we're certainly gonna want the price. And we're also going to wanna to grab the URL to the image so that we can show pretty pictures of bunnies. Because there are a bunch of images in every result, it's not as simple as using a basic CSS selector to query one. We have to use something a little bit more advanced. If you're not familiar with CSS selectors, check out the link to Mozilla's developer network in the details. They have a lot of information to get you started pretty quickly. This CSS selector is specifying an image element that has a parent that has a data-index attribute with a value of zero and has a parent with a class of swipe. This gives us the image element we're looking for, and we can get the source attribute from that image element in order to get the URL for the bunny picture. I've had to defensively code for the price and image URL options a little bit because there are some results that don't have a price or an image, and we have to account for undefined values. Running our script one last time, we see the browser open, we see a new page pop up, we see a navigation to a URL, we see the browser close, and on our console, we see a lot of data that we could easily use with any sort of program. A script like this is useful, but it's very limited. We're running it on our home machine, it's console logging. If we wanted to just wake up one day and check to see what bunnies were available, we could run our script. But if we wanted to make a mobile application or a web application or any program that interfaces with this data, We'd have to figure out how to set up a server. We'd have to get that server running Chrome. We'd have to set up everything associated with running a scalable internet service, which kind of sucks. Luckily though, we have Google's cloud functions, which allows us to use headless Chrome and deliver our functions virtually unchanged so that we don't have to do much work in order to turn this into an infinitely scalable service. We'll need to change just a few things. We'll have to make sure that it's running in headless mode and we'll have to have an argument that Chrome needs in order to run on the Google Cloud platform. Next, we're gonna have to change the way our function works just a little bit because logging to standard out is not suitable for a web server application. We need to export a method that takes a request and response object and uses that response object to issue a response. If you've ever used something like Express or Koa, you're gonna feel right at home here. To get that installed as a Google Cloud function, is as simple as copying and pasting your package.json and copying and pasting your script into the Google function interface. And then just like that, you have an incredibly scalable API that interfaces with web pages. This is obviously a contrived example, but even with services that have really good APIs, inevitably you'll come across some feature or content on the website that you wish was available in an API, but isn't. Now, 
you can use Headless Chrome, Node, Google Cloud Functions to make anything that is accessible on a web page accessible via an API. Anything that exists on a website anywhere can now be translated into an API that you can present and consume wherever you want. Thanks for watching. If you like this content or if you have any feedback or questions or anything, please leave a comment or reach out to me on Twitter at JSOverson. Thank you very much and see you next time.